Ashley Moser got to the hospital, she remembers uh, one of the medical personnel talking about uh, performing a CAT scan on um, Ashley Moser and that Ashley Moser was pregnant. I, I, I do think that's a hearsay statement. I don't have a good answer for that at the moment. Uh, it's yeah, Judge, if the court would permit, I'll try to think of something overnight, and I know the court's going to think about this too, but I, I, I think it's hearsay. Uh, at the hospital, Ashley Mosier asking her mother about the status of Veronica and uh, the mother telling Ashley that they were taking care of Veronica and that Ashley finally found out on Sunday that Veronica had died. Hearsay 401, 403. Veronica. Well, I think that is the reality of the situation, and I think it goes to try to assuage the angst that she's going through in the hospital. And Judge, you'll remember this was the objection where the mom, I think, is, is coming to see Ashley and saying, hey, we're, they're taking care of Veronica. Um, I think that is likely also hearsay. So you, you agree that that's hearsay? I think it's hearsay. Uh, Ashley being told at the hospital that she lost her unborn baby. I think that the issue, though, of her finding out on Sunday, being told that her daughter died, uh, I, Judge, I, I, I do think that's relevant. I mean, she finds out at some point that her daughter is dead. think on that too, Judge. Um, the fact that she lost her unborn baby, th th this is no different, Your Honor, than being told your uh, bone was broken or the bullet perforated your liver. These people that have testified to these injuries don't know it because they've seen it. They know it because they've been told it by doctors and they've lived with the consequences. And here, to not permit her the opportunity to describe her injury, an injury uh, significant injury of the loss of this unborn baby that she just had confirmed was alive earlier that day would put her in a far different position than all the other victims who've been allowed to testify about their injuries. Your Honor, and then there's a string of things that she had to relearn how to do. Um, I can give those to the court one by one or in a group. It's up to the court. Examples are how to use a spoon, how to transfer from the wheelchair to the bed, how to learn how to sit because her balance was bad, how to learn how to do quad coughs to get fluid out of her lungs and throat, uh, how to, you, how, I, I think they had her do something in a standing frame to keep her bones strong. She had to learn how to make a sandwich. Uh, she did physical therapy three to four times a week at Craig and no longer does the physical therapy. Uh, accommodations that have had to been, um, that they've done to uh, enable her to use the restroom, bathe, dress herself. She's fallen a few times since then. She's had subsequent infections. She was at Craig Rehab Hospital from August 12th to December 13th. Uh, that singular fact does not create unfair prejudice, Your Honor. If we were to go down the road of every single thing that she had to endure, and there's a ton over those 16 months, that would be potentially unfairly prejudicial. But the fact that their injury was such that she was at Craig Hospital for that period of time, uh, Your Honor, I, I don't believe is. And I see Ms. Brady standing up. Should I, should I stop talking? <laughs> I, he just said from August 12th to December 13th. Um, I just wanted to make sure that the record was clear. It's from August of 2012 yeah. to December of 2013. That's how I understood. And, and thank you, Ms. Brady. If I misstated that, thank you for, for clearing that up. The uh, ongoing infections, her falling, uh, the funeral information, while I think that is relevant, Your Honor, incredibly relevant under 401, I do also think that there is a um, legitimate 403 argument to those aspects of this. And the last thing I have is showing her a photograph of her daughter and asking if she ever saw her alive again after the movie. 
Uh, it, Judge, honestly, uh, with all the respect in the world due to Ms. Brady, um, it, it is inexplicable to me that we could go through the testimony of uh, this mother and not show her a picture of her daughter and not only have her identify that daughter, but at some point during this, discuss with her um, the death of her daughter and whether she's seen her again. And I don't know that I would use those words, Judge, but certainly the picture, showing her the picture has to be something that we allow. That, that can't be unfairly prejudicial. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm gonna think about these things. Ms. Brady, I'm sorry, did you wanna add something? I just wanna, about Why don't you go to the microphone? About the picture, Your Honor, I would just ask, what is the relevance of that? I mean, I think the point of that is so Ashley will start crying, as would any mother. Uh, it is to start crying, to evoke sympathy from the jury, and it, there's no relevance. There's no dispute that Veronica is Ashley's child, that Veronica died, that that is a tragic, tragic occurrence. If there was any relevance, I, I wouldn't object. There's no relevance and extreme prejudicial evoking of sympathy from the jury. Everyone in this courtroom will be heartbroken to watch Ashley see a picture of her daughter. And that's the point of showing the picture. With all due respect to Mr. Brockler, that's the point of it. It's not because anyone in here doubts that Veronica is Ashley's daughter, that Veronica died, that that is heartbreaking. And so I see no relevance. I get why you would want to do it, but this is a trial and there has to be relevance to it. And the relevance has to overcome the prejudicial effect. And I, I just, I think this is an easy decision that the prejudice of that way, way, way outweighs the relevance. So that's my last comment. All right, so both, both parties believe it's an easy decision, but both parties come out different ways.